So what we left off at 3 d newel press control U, grab the source code. Okay, so I guess um, I want to I want to break this now. Okay, there's there's four points. So yeah, I'm gonna pivot this polygon uh, around one of these pillars and see what happens. Okay, that's kind of more what I want, I think. And uh, okay, well it already has some problems, but I want to make it have worse problems. So I'm gonna tilt it. Sure. Oh, what did I just do? So now you could tell it's it's clearly not touching it, but it does break it. So how do you fix this? I should probably hide all the other pillars. Okay, it actually seemingly can handle just two polygons. It's not giving me any problems. Oh, okay, well. I guess what's happening is that we're looking at this point and this point, and we're comparing it against the plane, and we're seeing, oh, those points are farther away. This point is behind us, so it's actually just in the other direction, so we don't consider it. And same with this point, right, down here. That's in the other direction, down here, and that we don't consider. So the only points that we're considering are over here. For that reason, it thinks the blue plane is on top. When you're like here, these points are in the same direction, and when you look at them, they'll eventually hit the plane of blue. But as you move in closer, once you pass a certain threshold, those points are in the other direction, and so they'll never hit blue going that way. And that's when blue pops on top. So when T is less than zero, that means the thing is behind you. Like in this picture, this vertex over here is behind us. But if it's behind us, it must be in front of this blue plane, right? You know, why is this T even here? Maybe we just get rid of it. Uh, okay, it fails on the other side, but it works on this side. Maybe it's time to drop in the complicated part, which I wrote out but never actually went and tested. Drop it back in. Oh god, I do not feel like debugging this. I mean, I literally, I don't even know what this is going to do. You know, luckily my past self went and explained this whole process in a previously recorded video. Let me go check that out. Um, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. There's no way this is going to function. Alright, we get something. Uh... Okay, it doesn't work. Okay, so upon further research and um, putting my points and equations into this uh, 3D calculator here, you could see their planes extending outward from them. Uh, the blue one is in line with its plane, but the mango one is not, which means that I've been screwing up the planar equation this entire time. I probably didn't notice because all the other equations were straight up and down, and from my research, uh, it seems like I missed the negative sign here. Just switch this around. Let me just plop this in here. Yeah, this looks a lot more in line. It's hard to tell for certain because my coordinates are so big and it's hard to like zoom in precisely. But I mean, yeah, it looks like it's in line. Okay, it's been a bit, but now I think I finally actually got this to function. Um, it's, it's working from all angles and all distances now. And yeah, putting things into a 3D calculator to visualize things really helped. I had a couple of points that I was testing, so let me just plug them in. This is my view, and that uh, kind of matches here. You might notice, if we go back and forth, that it's actually um, not the same, and that's because the y-axis is flipped between the 3D calculator and the code. So let me just walk through this process then. So after we do a whole bunch of bounds checking stuff, if you remember from before, we then calculate the planes, and then we try to check if all the points of one polygon are on one side or the other. In this example, where you've got a sort of slanted polygon like this, right, if I put in, say, the blue plane, see it splits the points down the middle, right? And if I did that with the orange plane, right, again, you see that we split the points down the middle. So it's inconclusive. So even though these polygons aren't actually intersecting, you can't tell by just looking at the planes. So I came up with this method after thinking in the rain for a long time, a month and a half ago, which I then coded badly um, because it didn't work. I, I basically just completely rewrote the, the bottom half of it because I had like a for loop within a for loop and a for loop and that was completely unnecessary. So let me go step by step in this process. So this is the complicated part. You might remember from before there was this sort of idea of this separating axis theorem, where if you've got two polygons in 2D space, you can draw a line in between them that will separate them. And that same idea applies to 3D space, except instead of a line, it's now a plane. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just finding that plane. Um, so the first step we do is we wanna figure out 
which of these line segments of the I polygon, the orange polygon, cross the blue plane, because we want to find the intersection point with the plane. And we run this above plane function, which takes in an index for the point, as well as the plane we're testing against. And you know, it's just a less than or equal to type deal. So if you look at the function, right, we just multiply our points by a, you know, the whole ax plus by plus cz equals d type planar equation. And if it's greater than d, it's on one side. If it's less than d, it's on the other side. And again, what we're, what we're trying to do in this case is we're just trying to figure out which points are on which sides of the plane. So we go and do that for all of them. If we go and look at the point check array over here, you can see that it goes true, false, false, true, which makes sense because if you go and look at the lines over here, starting from I0, you kind of go, this would be true, false, false, these are on the same side, and then back to true again. Then we're just initializing some stuff that we'll use later. And now we're looping through to look at each of these line segments. This line of code checks to see when two consecutive points are on opposite sides of the plane. And so the first thing we have is true, and then we have false. Those are on opposite sides of the plane, so we enter in. Then we find a vector, which represents the line from 0 to 1 here. Then this line finds the t that you use in a parametric equation, basically the rate of change. And then you plug that in here to get the i point, which is the intersection point, which I will show. So there it is right there. We plopped it on, and you'll see that the intersection point is where 0 and 1 intersect with the plane that is formed by the polygon J, the blue polygon. Um, so now at this point, our goal is to figure out which of the lines of J I point is outside of, which um, in this case, it's the 0, 3 line. But it's not totally obvious how to figure that out, because you can't just use distance. So if I enable these planes, it forms a sort of infinitely extending box where each plane extends outwardly from each of the lines of the J polygon. And we're gonna to check to see if I point is on either side of each of these lines. And for only one of these, um, though potentially two if it was in one of the corners, will it be on the outside of the plane because all the other ones would be inside. And that's how we figure out where it is. Um, so let me just disable this again and just kind of go one by one here. So we initialize some stuff. And now we're gonna iterate through the lines of our J polygon, starting with 0 to 1. So um, we find the vector of that line that represents 0 to 1, which is this short segment up here, these two. And then from there, we calculate the plane by calculating its A, B, C, D coefficients, um, which gives us the plane. And I will draw the plane, right? It looks like that, just an infinitely extending outward plane. And then we just test to see is I point above or below the plane in the same kind of way that we did before. In this case, we get false, which means it's not outside, which means that it's inside. That is, it's under the line, so it would be inside the box just based on this one line alone. At this point, we have no knowledge of the other three lines. So it's underneath the first one. You'll see I have a commented out line here about testing against whether it's clockwise or not. I thought that the way that you drew the lines mattered, but apparently it doesn't. But yeah, we continue with that. Right, we do this for the one, two line, right? I enable that, we look at that. It's this line that's extending outward. Again, we find that it's inside, right? We should come up with the false value here, uh, and we do. Uh, we test again for the two, three line. So this is 2, 3 on the bottom here. Again, it's inside those regions. Pretend that the 0, 3 line didn't exist. And you'll see that, you know, if our 0, 3 line were extended out over here, it would be inside the box. But we haven't gotten to 0, 3 yet. But when we do, right, when we get to 0, 3, right, we find that actually it's outside of that box. Right, as opposed to all the other ones where it's inside. Here's the 0, 3 plane, and it's outside of that plane. So finally, outside is true, um, which means that they're not all inside, because if they were all inside, then that would mean that the two polygons were intersecting with each other, which means that it fails and we can't render it correctly. But 
That didn't happen, so we're good. And JD uses the line segment index that we're saving. But you might actually notice, though, that there are actually two I points that are valid in this case, right? So there's one of the I points and another one of the I points because there's two different lines and they both intersect with the plane and they would both be valid. But we only want to use the closest line. So I found this neat formula on line here, which does it. Right, and um, let me just draw a diagram just to demonstrate that real quick. So let's just imagine that we have a line from P1 to P2 and a point P0, and we want to find the shortest distance from that dot to this line over here. And then once we get the cross product of that, we take the magnitude of the cross product and we divide it by the magnitude of the line segment. And so that's just what I'm doing here. The P1, P0 vector wasn't declared at that point, so we have to make it which is what we do there. We take the cross product, and then I create this calc magnitude of vector function, which you'll see here, we just take the sum of the squares and then return the square root. So we get that and we get 282. The magnitude of the cross product ends up being very large, but then we just divide it and we find out, oh, it's 17 units, right? Which um, seems about right because you'll see like the scale on the side here and that's like really close to it, but the scale on the outside is like in the hundreds. So you can imagine that being about 17, the distance between I point and this line. So we go and remember that value for later. Now let's go and find the separating plane. And the way that I make this separating plane is that we take the line segment that I point lies on, which here is I zero to I one. And we take the closest line segment of J, which is J0 to J3, and we take the cross product of those two to get a plane, All right? So this is what this is doing here. We're getting the cross product. So this is our plane, the green thing. And you'll see that this plane runs parallel to the zero one line of the orange polygon, but that it also runs parallel to the zero three line of the J polygon. And by doing that, we're able to put each of the polygons on either side of the plane. But at this point, we don't know whether the player is on the same side of the plane as the orange eye polygon. So that's what we're going to try and figure out. So we first do a player test. And by doing that test, we figure out which side of the plane the player is on. In this case, we get a true value. So that means that because player is true, well, all these other eye points are on the opposite side, so they should all turn up false, right? So we're gonna go through all of the points and check all of them. We kind of do that same test. We do the same thing. We check to see, are they on the same side? And in all cases, we should end up being false. So we do that for all of them. And also, well, if that value changed, then that means the check failed. That would happen in the case where these would be intersecting, you know, and it's a fail condition. You know, then there's just no way to separate them. But then we repeat the process for that other line. We're going to check the I2 to I3 line up here because we don't know that could potentially be closer. So we go through all that again. Let me just skip through it really quick because it doesn't matter. You also might notice that all of these numbers are stupidly large over here too. You could probably fix that by normalizing the vector because scale doesn't really matter with them. But I mean, that will only cause a problem if the numbers get too big for JavaScript to be able to handle them. I don't know how large JavaScript goes. Anyway, we eventually come down here the second time and you'll see that the distance is now 47 instead of 17. And so because that's not closer, we just continue through the loop, which at this point we then exit the loop. If the check failed, then we do nothing. But if the polygon is not closer, we do the swap. Otherwise, we don't do the swap. And if you'll remember, swap manage just says set these two things in stone. Don't try to check the, and compare whether these polygons need to be swapped again. So we have this working. Um, now, what I don't know is if this works all of the time. Um, I'm scared. I am definitely very scared to test this. Go and uncomment these things. Let's just start with one pillar just to see how that looks. Um, and, uh, oh, Ugh. we keep coming one step closer to getting this to actually function. I changed how the plane test worked as well, right? So I was finding that um, I was still having problems sometimes with this polygon rendering in the wrong direction. That basically what was happening is that within the, the testing algorithm down here, it wouldn't get to the complicated part that it would end up just swapping the polys on the plane test. And so I realized that my plane test algorithm was actually garbage. 
right? So this is the old one that's commented out, and here's the new one right here just above it. And I basically I just took the same method that I was doing before um, with the above plane test, um, and it actually just ends up being computationally easier anyway. Basically, we just check to see are all the points of the polygon on the same side as the player because before we were doing the distance between each of those points and that could end up with the bug where the points are closer but it's actually not closer because what i showed at the beginning of the video yeah let's just draw all the pillars um okay yeah no it looks normal it looks fine right other than the fact that sometimes that will bug out and wait a minute I just saw something weird uh, see, like, what the, what is that garbage? What is this gar- okay, this. Oh my god. Did you just see that? What the frick is this garbage? I, I, can I, can I just not fix this for now? Can I just, can I just ignore it and just do something slightly more visually interesting? Okay, I made a house. You know, that looks okay, right? So, I mean, like, uh, from a distance, it looks pretty decent. All the other objects are being rendered correctly. Let's, uh, go inside. Okay, it looks, and, um, oh, oh boy. Yeah, um, so, you know, it's, um, it's a little buggy. Obviously, the walls have no collision. Ah, uh, yeah, this, this is not acceptable. This, this has to be fixed. Um, 